In this video, we're going to discuss different types of fibres you can use in the workshops at Art and Design UNSW. The definition of a fibre is a natural or synthetic substance that's significantly longer than it is wide. These are fibres you can use to create textiles for the body, for things like clothing, bags, jewellery or domestic and public spaces, for things like curtains, floor coverings, linen or soft furnishings. Uh, cushions, upholstery, lampshades. So here you can see samples of the textiles we're going to discuss. These have been laid out in accordance to whether they're natural or regenerated polymer, synthetic polymer or non-polymer fibres. And first we're going to focus on natural fibres. So natural fibres come in two types, cellulose and protein. Cellulose fibres are the ones that come from plants. They contain cellulose, and one way of identifying them is the smell that comes off that. It smells just like burnt paper. So all of those cellulose fibres, which is this group, will all give essentially that smell of burnt paper. Cellulose fibres include ones that are taken from the stalk of the plant, so they're called bast fibres. These two are flax. And here I've spun them into yarn. Um, this one is the natural fibre, and then this one has been bleached. And so flax is used to make linen. Examples of leaf fibres include raffia, which you often see plaited and braided. You make hats and baskets or coiled together, things like coasters. Then we've got the seed fibres, which are cotton. This one's kapok. So basically, it's too short to spin very well, but it's traditionally used for stuffing and core. So core is the coconut fibre. And here we have a couple of objects that are created from coconut fibre. These are used in Chinese printmaking. So protein fibres are the ones that come from animals. They're usually hair with the exception of silk. And when you burn these fibres, they smell like burnt chops. The protein samples, we have the hair from different animals, from um, alpaca, camel and cashmere. We have wool from sheep, and there's many varieties of the wool. This is merino wool, which is used in the apparel industry. And then silk, which is from silkworms. Protein fibres such as merino, cashmere, camel and horsehair are staple fibres. The staple length means when I cut the, the wool off the animal, this length is what's referred to as the staple and the wave that's in it is called the crimp. So the crimp in merino wool makes it extremely warm and comfortable. Cashmere is super warm, um, even warmer than wool and it, it's also much finer so it can be really soft. If you know these basic categories of cellulose and protein, you can choose all sorts of process methods to suit, like which kind of dye processes to use, and those are the sorts of things you'll learn in the textile workshop here at Art and Design. Synthetic fibres are the ones that are made from polymers, largely petroleum-based. A property of polyester is that it's very heat sensitive and it can be heat set into permanent shapes. Because they're heat sensitive, you can put them into a mould, a shape something like this, and then steam them and then you have a permanent pleat. There's also non-polymer based synthetics and that's things like metals, glass, gold and silver would be in that category.
A critical factor for fibre's use in fabric is the staple length of the fibre. To create strength, we impart twist and that gives us a tensile strength. And then the direction of that twist is either S twist or Z twist. Spinning of Basque fibres around the world were traditionally done through finger spinning. So I've got two different colours so you can see. So in Australian Indigenous communities, they, they tend to roll on their thigh and then others finger spin. So the idea is, so on the downward roll, the downward movement, you're rolling the fibres individually. Put a bit more twist in that. And then on the upward gesture, you're rolling them together. So on the down movement you twist one direction and then you ply it together on the, on the backward run. So that's two fibres plied together. So after hand spinning, then tools started appearing in order to make the spinning process a little easier. So this is called a drop spindle. And this is one travelling spindle that I picked up in Istanbul, which flat packs and I think it's lovely that it just goes together. It's quite heavy, so I think it would have been used for stuff like camel hair, which is quite coarse, and with, for rug making and things for making carpets. This is some alpaca, so here's the staple length of the alpaca, and the idea is we're going to align those staple fibres and impart twist into them. So I can simply spin here and then draw. And then as I create a thread, I wrap it onto the spindle. the way I can continue. Felt is also something they would have just discovered naturally because it occurred on a, on a sheep or an animal. It's just a matter of warmth and abrasion where you're, you have moisture and heat and then you have abrasion and ultimately they start tangling together and shrinking together. So the scales on the side of the, of the staple length of the wool fibre are really suited to locking together and interlinking. But another nice thing about felt is that you can mould it into different shapes. So these pieces are lovely examples of that malleability of the material to mould into shape. Weaving can also be used to create forms. And if you think about the, um, using Basque fibres, these are some baskets that are woven together just using cane. So again you can create structural forms. You can also use linking and looping methods right down to really fine work, tatting and lace making. And this one is crocheted lace. So woven fabrics are basically created from a warp and a weft. So the warp is the strongest, it's the one that's under tension on the loom and we call that warp line the grain line. The other thing that you can think about on a, any material that you buy is the, the very edge is called the selvage edge. It's usually woven qu quite tightly. And so when we make a garment out of a piece of cloth that has a warp and a weft, the warp is the strongest and so we put the, the warp in line with gravity. A warp and weft that if we put it diagonally, so it's on a bias, then we have a lot of stretch and movement. It's a bit like a picket fence that can collapse different directions. And so we can cut things on a bias to have a lot of drape and a lot of curvature. And a good trick is to line your selvage up with the edge of the table so that you know that you've got a, something to make the 
the grain line parallel with. There's many different sorts of looms, but essentially their job is to organise the warp and the weft threads and make it easier to interlace the weft in and out of the warp. To put the warp in, you can have something as simple as a, a shuttle like this, which will help pass that through the shed that's created backwards and forwards. These are a couple of really old ones that are just hand carved, carved out of solid pieces of timber and then slightly more modern ones. So depending on what sort of loom and what sort of material you're working with, there are all sorts of shuttles to ones that are assisted with some wheels on the bottom and this one's called a boat shuttle. So you have a bobbin of thread that sits in here and that way you can throw that across quite a, a long gap in your fibres, the shed between warp, the, the warps opening and closing and this one gets thrown backwards and forwards to make that faster. These days in an industrialised process the thread is usually carried across by either air jet or water jet that throws the, the thread backwards and forwards. This fabric is created on a different sort of loom, it's on inkle loom. So on an inkle loom we call that a warp faced design because the weft is quite tight and so the warp is what makes the pattern show up. On a normal loom, if you were going to have a weft faced design, you'd spread your warps out enough and really pack down the, the weft and so the weft is what is visible, so you end up with stripes and things. This one is more like an even count, so the warp and the weft are about equally spaced and you see both of them at the same time. The most common structure for apparel textiles today is knitted. So knitting is needlework created by interlacing yarn in a series of connected loops using straight eyeless needles or using a machine. So knitted fabrics are stretchy, which makes them quite comfortable. Industrial manufactured knits have the same structure as hand knits, so the structure of your t-shirt is the same as hand knitting. With knitted materials, because it's just one row, either in a tubular knit, in the industry you'll, you'll have just one tube coming straight down, or on a bed running backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, but unlike weaving which you have warps and weft, this is one continuous row of, inter, of, of yarn with interlinking loops. So if one of these loops gets broken, it can start unlooping everything underneath it. And so if you're sewing material that is knitted, you should use a, a ballpoint needle because if you use a sharp needle, you're likely to snap one of those threads and then you end up with, with runs. So the principle of knitting, and this is just plain knitting, I'm using circular needles, but they could just as easily be two straight needles is a series of interlinking loops. I'm wrapping around my needle and pulling a loop through. One row of loops, I'm linking in and pulling through the next row of loops. So another tip working with stretch materials is when you've laid that out on the table, you need to let it relax because it'll tend to shrink down a little bit. So if you cut it out straight away, you're likely to, your pattern pieces will end up smaller than you'd anticipated. So far we've discussed basic fibre properties and fabric construction, knowledge that's the foundation for many choices for your own textile design. For example, we saw that thermoplastics can be permanently pleated and that felt can be moulded. Techniques for joining and spinning short lengths of materials such as raffia into longer lengths. So these kinds of techniques can be adapted to combine with contemporary technologies and materials. So these are moldable thermoplastics. And there's Warblas. Christoform, Wonderflex. That's just the Warblas in black. And this one is, is fully recyclable. So you can heat them up, they can change form, and then they can set I really like this one because you can stitch into it later and it makes a great form for supporting all sorts of things, so often used in costume design. Or other materials like Tyvek, which is pitched as being a non-tearable paper. It's actually a DuPont plastic and it operates like paper, really nice and lightweight. This one on the other hand is a biomaterial, so this is 
kombucha. And there's lots of experiments going on with things like mycelium, which is also a grown replacement for leather, which is from the root fibres from mushroom. Knowledge of materials enables you to intervene in the production process at various levels. For example, printing thermochromatic dyes onto the warp threads before weaving. Traditionally, different techniques have developed over generations, closely linked to the cultivation of the materials needed to produce the fibre and the colours to colour that fibre. So these are examples from the 1920s of Chinese ear cuffs. So you'll learn things like mark making, how to make repeat motives, and then how to transfer that to a silk screen and make a repeat print or digital heat transfer like this where you transfer onto a paper and then heat transfer. You can combine traditional textile techniques with innovative approaches. For example, this is a double knit merino wool. Um, it's basically using a technique of smocking using reflective thread on the very edge of the smocking fabric, also on this top ridge. So smocking's usually done in a much finer gauge than this, and so you, uh, you create something quite contemporary. You can combine traditional textile techniques with different sorts of innovations in technology such as laser printing, laser etching, 3D printing. So laser etching into different materials, you can, you can etch into the surface. 3D printing, there's lots of possibilities. You don't need to be able to do digital drawings. We've got scanners, so you can just scan around an object and then lay it out and send it to print. And in this case, we've put the first layer of printing down, then laid in a textile substrate and then continued the printing process and we end up with something that's quite articulated. There's lots of new materials available. So from stretch to conductive to, to rubbers, um, there's also metal materials and all sorts of innovation in that space between 3D printing, laser cutting, laser etching and traditional techniques that we've discussed already. These are some conductive threads, so you can use these to be either creating a soft circuit. This one's made of copper, this one's made of silver, and different sorts of metals. You can use them in the sewing machine as well, on the bobbin, or you can use them in embroidery. For example, you can embroider with conductive thread using this circuitry to put LED lights around something, or in this case, using thermochromatic inks. So when this current runs through, it warms up and it change, changes the colour of the dyes. 